Welcome, everybody. It is our 27th uh, insta installment, thank you, of the ATS COVID-19 Critical Care Training Forum. So we wanted to welcome you all. We're going to get started in just a few seconds. Today, we are excited uh, about our hot topic on the management of patients with severe ARDS due to COVID-19 and how to manage them uh, with ECMO. My computer is not cooperating with me. There we go. So I will be your moderator, moderator today. I'm uh, Dr. Laura Crowdy alexander here at UCSD. And we're excited to have Dr. Mazin Odish uh, as the leader and presenter of this session. And he's gonna introduce our stellar lineup. Um, hi everyone, my name is Mazin Odish. I'm one of the um, pulmonary curl care junior faculty here at UCSD. I'm also one of the uh, T32 fellows. So um, today we're going to have a session um, and we're going to start with about ECMO. We're going to start with Dr. McGuire, who will be talking to us and up, will give us an update on COVID-19 literature. Then Dr. Sullivan, um, who will give us two, two ECMO cases we had here at UCSD. And then I'll be discussing our ECMO program here at UCSD. And then we have two world experts in ARDS and ECMO management, um, Dr. Fan, who will be going next and then following up by Dr. Brody. And I'll reintroduce everyone as they, um, as they uh, start their session. So first, we're going to start with Dr. McGuire, who's one of our oh. second year. I'm um, oh, sorry, oh. go ahead. Hold on one second. I uh, just wanted to uh, show everybody our disclosures for the faculty today and the organizers. Um, these are our educational objectives for those of you who would like CME uh, credit. Um, to claim the CME credit, you just need to fill out the evaluation for today's forum, and we'll be pasting this in the chat box. Um, this is also a great way to give us feedback about the session and let us know what other topics you would like to hear about. We have 26 recorded sessions uh, available for free on the ATS website. We've covered a lot uh, across this pandemic uh, over the COVID-19 disease process and how to treat it. And we'll be pasting uh, this link as well so that you can find those and browse them at your leisure. Um, this session wouldn't be possible without the, our huge team of organizers, uh, but namely the ATS staff, uh, Lauren Lynch, Liz Guzman, Eileen Larson, and Rebecca Fish. So with that, uh, I'll hand the mic over to Dr. Odish again, and I hope you guys enjoy the session. Thank you, Dr. Crotty. So um, the First person that's going to be presenting is Dr. McGuire. He's one of our second year pulmonary curl care fellows here at UCSD. Um, he completed his intro medicine residency at Colorado, where he was also a chief. And he's going to be giving us an update on um, the COVID-19 literature. Go ahead, Cameron. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mazin. Can everybody hear me and see my screen okay? Yes, sir. All right, great. So it's great to be back joining you all for my fourth installment of updates and controversies in the COVID-19 literature. Last I spoke with you, I believe was in August. Um, so stay tuned for some updates. Typically we go for the past week, but just because of some of the important studies that have been published in the past few weeks, I'll probably go back as far as mid-November. Um, this is a landscape of the COVID literature. Uh, there are currently 78,375 papers with COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, et cetera, in their title on PubMed. Um, in the past week, 2,102 have been published between November 30th and December 6th. You can see the sort of huge spike in late August. There were some interesting studies back then, which we've previously discussed. So topics for today, we'll start with hydroxychloroquine. I think this is a deja vu. I've talked about it. I think every time I've done this, except for one, um, newsflash, it still does not work. So three major studies published in the past month, uh, the recovery group, uh, recovery collaborative group from the UK published this November 19th. Um, in Spain, they published this uh, article um, about hydroxy, or sorry, this is Brazil, hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin. And then a cluster randomized trial of hydroxychloroquine from Spain, um, also both in November. Basically, uh, suffice it to say, regardless of the severity of illness prior to receiving HCQ, um, or whether it was used as post-exposure prophylaxis, as was the case um, in, in the uh, Brazil study, there's no 
suggestion of benefit in any of the studies that have been published um, to this point that have been done in a randomized controlled fashion. I won't go into the details of these studies too much because I think we've kind of hammered this point home over the past uh, 20 something installments. But just to, to sort of put a bow on this, uh, it still still does not work. So these are the trials that show benefit. Um, these were all very early. Some of them were not peer reviewed prior to being um, run with by the media. The total N of the studies that did not show benefit was 3,151. These are the trials on the right hand side of my slide that don't show benefit. And you'll notice that the N there is uh, a whopping nearly 11,000. And even if you take out the two initial retrospective studies from Rosenberg in New York and then the VA study, which was across the country, um, just the RCTs alone have a, an N of nearly 9,000. So again, hydroxychloroquine doesn't work, um, moving on. Convalescent plasma, another hot topic, uh, hasn't seemed to pan out, but it is, there are some significant limitations. So there's three major trials worth talking about, only one published recently. This first one in JAMA was in June, uh, come from a group from China that actually did show a suggestion of benefit in a severe class of COVID-19 patients. So those are patients with supplemental oxygen or non-invasive ventilation, but not yet requiring mechanical ventilation. However, it was stopped early due to lack of efficacy, driven predominantly by the, um, by the group who were in life-threatening ARDS, i.e. those already on mechanical ventilation. When they did a subgroup analysis, there seemed to be a suggestion of benefit in the severe um, illness, but not life-threatening illness subgroup but it wasn't powered to detect benefit. So then another group did a study quite small in September uh, of 2020, total of 39 patients at Mount Sinai Hospital who got convalescent plasma after um, symptom onset and uh, a positive COVID test. They received their convalescent plasma within eight days of symptom onset, um, a median of eight days. The range was four to 10. Um, that was basically retrospectively matched in a one to four fashion to 156 controls um, who also had COVID-19 but did not get convalescent plasma. And there was a suggestion of overall survival benefit at 14 days, um, as well as about a 12% decrease in um, the amount of supplemental oxygen that was required in those who received plasma. Very small study, as I mentioned. So the one that was recently published two weeks ago in New England Journal was this randomized trial of convalescent plasma and COVID-19, two to one randomization. So two times as many patients got convalescent plasma as did not. And again, it was in patients who basically had an exposure, positive um, symptoms within six days and a positive PCR test confirming COVID-19 pneumonia. Um, at the, in all of the both primary and secondary endpoints for clinical improvement, which was based on an ordinal scale of one to six, there was no suggestion of benefit in any of the primary or secondary endpoints. There was also not really any significant harm um, either. So not a ton of benefit, but again, all really small studies and there's, there's not, there have not been a ton of randomized controlled trials as compared to the previously mentioned hydroxychloroquine studies. So perhaps stay tuned, but it looks like convalescent plasma is falling out of favor. All right, remdesivir is a big one. There's a lot of equipoise here. So this came out at the end of November that the WHO recommends against the use of remdesivir in COVID-19 patients. This is their living, um, recommendation document, which is updated nearly hourly. So this uh, screenshot is from about four hours ago. Basically their conditional recommendation is against using remdesivir in addition to standard of care, regardless of disease severity. It's actually kind of interesting that the day this came out, two, subsequent to that, there've been two um, editorials in, in major journals in Lancet November 26th and New England Journal last week, basically saying that approval of remdesivir um, was was it the right thing to do and that there is still a place for it in treatment of COVID-19 in spite of these WHO recommendations. Those, um, those editorials are probably founded on these three trials. So um, in JAMA, in September 15th, they published a study. This was Gilead sponsored, the makers of remdesivir showing benefit. And then two subsequent trials came out, published in uh, New England Journal about a month ago. One Gilead sponsored this, this one right here, remdesivir for five or 10 days. And then one that was independently done by the NIAID, of which one of our faculty members, Dan Sweeney, was a, was a PI. And all of these did show benefit to remdesivir in terms of clinical improvement, although there was no significant benefit in mortality. Um, the WHO Solidary trial, which came out the same day as the New England Journal editorial saying FDA approval of remdesivir was the right thing to do, um, argues otherwise that there is no significant benefit in mortality or in any uh, clinical improvement endpoints. 
So I think the debate is still there. I think since the since these study results have started to come out, at least here at UCSD, what I've noticed is that if there is a reason to stop remdesivir, like rising liver function enzyme abnormalities or acute kidney injury kind of out of nowhere, that those may be indications to stop remdesivir. But otherwise, I think our practice here is that we have continued to use it. So where does that leave us therapeutically? Um, this is from that WHO living document. Again, a screen grab from about four hours ago. This is pretty small, but I think the main thing to focus on is just the colors and it's pretty bleak. Um, there aren't a lot of colors that are green. Green means go, red means stop, yellow means slow down. So the only things that really have a significant suggestion of benefit based on the data that are out there at this point are corticosteroids based on our knowledge of the recovery trial, as well as some other subsequent ones that have been published and maybe remdesivir, uh, particularly in that there aren't a lot of significant adverse events, although there may not be as much suggestion of benefit as, as has previously been thought. Noticeably, pretty much everything else on this document doesn't have any significant benefit. So the fact that vaccines are on the horizon is, is reassuring, particularly since a lot of the therapeutics that we've been pinning our hopes and dreams on haven't seemed to pan out. A couple of really quick hitters. Um, there was a statistically significant increase in cardiac uh, arrests related to overdose during the first few months of the COVID pandemic. This was published in the uh, JAMA Psychiatry just a few days ago. Metformin might be a new drug to pin our hopes and dreams on, at least for our obese and type 2 diabetic female patients, so a subset of a subset of a subset. But nevertheless, there seemed to be a decrease in the um, uh, overall mortality with women who were treated with metformin who were COVID-19 positive with a hazard ratio of 0.79 and a confidence interval that did not cross one. Really small down here, but hazard ratio 0.785, confidence interval went up to 0.95, p-value 0.015. And then the last two quick hitters, the last one of which will transition us nicely into our ECMO talk, um, is about infection. So first and foremost, aspergillus rates aren't increased in COVID-19 ARDS. This is important as we embark on the uh, sort of the worst months of the flu epidemic. If the flu ends up being as bad as it has been in previous years, there's a strong association with aspergillus and flu ARDS. Um, they basically, these researchers uh, in Clinical Microbio, which was just published online a couple of days ago, uh, compared COVID-19 ARDS, flu ARDS, and streptococcal pneumonia ARDS, and found similar rates of aspergillus in COVID-19 as to streptococcal pneumonia, and four times the rate in flu ARDS. And then last but not least, patients on ECMO have a significant um, increase in ventilator-associated pneumonia rates, particularly fairly late in their hospitalization. I think the average day of onset was something like 16 days in this study that was just published in Annals of Intensive Care last week. Um, and what was most notable was that almost all of those ventilator-associated pneumonias, not sorry, not almost all, but a large proportion of those ventilator-associated pneumonias were ESBL and or pseudomonas. So if you have a patient on ECMO um, who's getting worse, having worse oxygenation, you're going up on some of your ECMO parameters, which we'll talk about momentarily, think about VAP um, and think about treating aggressively up front for a fairly drug-resistant VAP. So thanks again, it's been a pleasure doing these since this is our last uh, ATS CCCTF for a while. Uh, I appreciate you tuning in and um, look forward to hearing all the great things about ECMO. Thanks, Dr. Odish. Thank you, Dr. McGuire for that um, great presentation. Um, we're gonna now start with our ECMO cases. So Dr. Sullivan, who is one of our first year pulmonary creole care fellows at UCSD, who completed her internal medicine residency at UCLA where she was also a chief, is gonna give us two uh, ECMO cases, one longer one and a, one that was a little shorter. Go ahead, Lauren, thank you. Hi everyone, nice to meet you, sort of, and happy holidays. Um, again, my name's Lauren Sullivan, I'm a first year at UCSD, and I'll be sharing two cases from UCSD that are, that are relevant to our talk today about the management of patients with COVID, ARDS with ECMO. So our first case is RB. RB, and this is in June of 2020. So RB is a 54 year old man. He has history of hypertension and he presented to an outside hospital with fever for two weeks and progressive shortness of breath and cough for one week. And he was found to have COVID-19 pneumonia. On hospital day one, he, was, um, he arrived with O2 sats in the seventies and initially was placed on high flow nasal cannula. He was given cefaxone, azithro, remdesivir, convalescent plasma and therapeutic anoxaparin. 
On hospital day two, he had an episode of small volume hemoptysis and anoxaparin was discontinued. Unfortunately, he had progressive hypoxemia, required intubation. He had a bronchoscopy, which showed old blood in the left lower lobe, but no active bleeding. And then on hospital day three, he had worsening hypoxemia and poor lung compliance and was cannulated by the UCSD mobile ECMO team. His ECMO cannulation, he, uh, a drainage cannula was placed in the right femoral vein, a 25 French, and the return cannula was a 21 French um, in the right internal jugular. And that was able to achieve ECMO flows of 4.25 liters per minute with a negative venous pressure of minus 60. And the sweep was set to three liters a minute. Um, you can see his pre and post ECMO gases with improvement in both the PCO2 and the PO2. And just to note the size of the ECMO cannulas are based on the patient's anatomy and kind of the largest that can be accommodated to allow for um, higher flows on ECMO. So on arrival, his physical exam was really notable for hypotension um, requiring a norepinephrine drip. Um, he was initially on VTPC, but satting well, and a RAS of minus four on Versed and fentanyl, but otherwise nothing too notable on exam. The ECMO cannulas looked fine. Um, to note though, while he arrived on VTPC, um, we typically transition our patients to lung protective ventilation, which is a pressure control mode. We call it 10, 10, 10, where we do a respiratory rate of 10, a driving pressure of 10 and a PEEP of 10. To note though that um, in this patient, his lung compliance was so poor that that driving pressure of 10 initially only resulted in tidal volumes of about 50 to 100 cc's. And this is something we monitor throughout their course to um, evaluate for improvements in lung compliance. So on arrival, his labs were actually not too remarkable other than an elevated CK and a markedly elevated D-dimer. You can see his PO2 has um, come up nicely on the, the ECMO and the ventilator. Um, so here's his chest X-ray from hospital day one, our hospital day one, and you can see um, the um, cannula in the right internal jugular, as well as down here, a little bit harder to see, but it's in the um, intrahepatic IVC. And he just basically had marked um, progression of bilateral consolidations, which can be seen on um, these chest X-rays on hospital day two and four. I wanted to share his chest CT from hospital day four. I promise it's windowed correctly in the lung windows and you can see basically complete consolidation of the lungs compatible with diffuse alveolar damage or ARDS, trace volume bilateral effusions. You'll see at the very bottom on the right, some a little bit of aerated lung that begins to kind of come into view there, but um, pretty profound consolidations. Um, so we'll go through his hospital course, which can kind of highlight some of the complications and um, challenges that arise in caring for these patients. So hospital day one, he undergoes cannulation on ECMO. His first real issue was on hospital day eight, he developed an ileus, which was thought related to the higher doses of fentanyl he was receiving. And you can see the dilated loops of bowel on the axial cut of the CT. On hospital day 11, he developed a lower GI bleed um, for which heparin, um, need to be held. This was managed conservatively. Hospital day 12 though, he's able to work with physical therapy and dangled at the edge of the bed. Um, on hospital day 15, he underwent a bedside tracheostomy by the interventional pulmonary team. At our institution, we um, typically these patients will undergo tracheostomy within the first one to two weeks of their course. And um, our IP team has been assisting us with the majority of those. Um, unfortunately on hospital day 18, he had worsening agitation, bent to propofol, fentanyl, Presidex, ketamine, as well as midazolam and Haldol pushes as needed. And then on hospital day 19, he had yet another bleeding complication of epistaxis. The heparin was held and he had to be started on paralytics as well as an esmolol drip to kind of knock down his heart rates to um, improve his flows through the ECMO circuit. To note though, I mentioned um, how we kind of look at the tidal volume on those same lung protective settings and his tidal volumes had improved to about 200 cc's. Uh, give or take, and you can see maybe some improvement in his chest X-ray here on hospital day 19. Unfortunately, as Cameron mentioned, um, uh, on hospital day 20, he did develop um, shock requiring vasopressors and concern for ventilator-associated pneumonia. He had a bronchoscopy with BAL, which showed purulent secretions, and his femoral cannula was also repositioned due to frequent suction events. On hospital day 22 and 23, he had some issues with desaturations, tachypnea, he was unable to participate in um, physical therapy and was re-paralyzed, excuse me, on hospital day 26. Um, on hospital day 27, he had a CT head, which showed a small left frontal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Heparin was held again, and 
uh, though the bleed was stable on serial CAT scans. And then on hospital day 29, he had a CT chest which showed a hydropneumothorax. Uh, this was conservatively managed without a chest tube and the PEEP was decreased. He was able to work with PT though on this same day. Hospital day 32, he has um, an occult bleed and receives two units of blood. And then hospital day 33 through 39, his mental status improves. He's regularly able to work with PT and he undergoes sweep challenges um, on, on ECMO. And his tidal volumes continue to improve in the 400 to 500 range with continued improvement on his chest X-ray as shown. On hospital day 41, he's decannulated from ECMO and is under, undergoes pressure support trials. And then by hospital day 44, he's able to walk with physical therapy and tolerating trach collar during the day. He, um, on hospital day 45, was transferred back to an acute care hospital near his home. And then our last update is that he was discharged to a skilled nursing facility and did, and did leave that other hospital. So here's his total hospital course with just a few of the things that happened to him that was a total of 45 days. Um, We'll shift gears and, and talk about another patient, patient CE. Um, and this was in May of 2020. Um, she was a 44 year old woman with obesity who was a nurse at a skilled nursing facility uh, who presented to an outside hospital with two days of shortness of breath and fever. On hospital day one, she was COVID PCR positive and her chest x-ray showed peripheral patchy opacities and she was placed on high flow nasal cannula. Unfortunately, she worsened on hospital day two and was intubated and um, put on pressure control on the ventilator with an FiO2 of 100%. She was paralyzed, prone, and inhaled nitric oxide was started. She's also given remdesivir and an empiric heparin drip. On um, hospital day 23, or three, um, she had some improvement with proning, um, but the remdesivir was stopped due to a developing AKI. She also received convalescent plasma on this day. And then unfortunately on hospital days four and five, she had a progressive rise in her serum creatinine with oliguria and on hospital day five was started on CRRT. On hospital day six, she was cannulated by the UCSD mobile ECMO team. Her cannulation, she did have smaller um, cannulas due to her anatomy, but she was able to achieve flows of 4.2 liters per minute with a negative venous pressure of minus 115. You can see the pretty marked improvement in both her acidosis, PCO2 and PO2. Um, the, there was some difficulty with her right femoral access and her stats were in the 80s while prone just prior to cannulation. Her physical exam on arrival to our hospital was noted for hypotension requiring a norepinephrine drip, uh, SpO2 of only um, high 80s on 100%, and um, she was intubated, sedated, paralyzed, and her pupillary exam was normal. Otherwise, um, nothing too remarkable. Her labs on arrival though were notable for a profound anemia with a hemoglobin of 5.8, platelets of 105, a BUN of 54 over 6.5, an elevated AST, an INR of 1.9, and a PTT of 173. So here's her chest X-ray on hospital day one and just pointing out her drainage and return cannulas in both the right IJ and the intrahepatic IVC. So her hospital course, um, on hospital day one, her PEEP was maintained at 15 for low PAO2s and she was given vasopressors for shock. She was given two units of blood for her hemoglobin of 5.8, and this was thought possibly related to blood loss from the ECMO cannulation. CRRT was restarted. On hospital day two, a stroke code was called at 12.50 p.m. for uneven pupils with a left pupil, six millimeters irregular and non-reactive to light. Her right pupil was three millimeters round, but sluggish to light. She was given a hypertonic saline and taken to CT scan where unfortunately her head CT showed multifocal parenchymal hemorrhages involving both frontal lobes, the left temporal lobe and left occipital lobe with mass effect of 17 millimeters of left to right midline shift, effacement of the left lateral ventricles, as well as subarachnoid hemorrhage layering within the bilateral frontal parietal self -sci, with no aneurysm appreciated. So uh, neurosurgery and neurocritical care teams were both consulted um, but due to the extent of the bleed, surgery was not recommended. Um, it was thought that these might have represented prior infarcts with, with um, subsequent bleeding that was thought to be maybe more subacute. And uh, she was transitioned to comfort care, compassionately extubated after her family visited and expired on hospital day two. So just some reflections to start and guide our discussion about the use of ECMO in COVID patients. Um, some patients may require a very long ECMO course that can be fraught with bleeding and infectious complications, particularly VAPs, as well as challenges related to sedation and delirium management. 
um, imaging, as we saw in our first case, may not necessarily prognosticate the outcome. And um, to note that we're going to hear more about anticoagulation, but anticoagulation is not always necessary as long as there's adequate ECMO circuit blood flow, and you may use lower PTT goals while on heparin. Uh, physical therapy is feasible and necessary, even with the ECMO cannulas in place. And we still don't know the benefit of empiric anticoagulation for COVID-19 without confirmed VTE. And obviously there's some risks associated, including intracranial hemorrhages in our second patient. So that wraps up my two cases and thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Sullivan, for those two cases. I think the reason why we asked you to present those two cases is one, the first case kind of represented, like you said, every complication we can kind of see on ECMO, including the long ECMO courses. And the second one, unfortunately, the unforeseen, the challenges that we have with mobile ECMO and full anticoagulation and brain bleeds. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen now. All right. Okay, so can you guys see this? Is it the presenter view or the regular view? Regular. Perfect. So um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. My name is Mazin Odish. I'm one of the um, junior faculty here at UCSD. I'm also a fourth year fellow on the T32. Um, and I'm really gonna talk to us about the elements of a comprehensive ECMO program. UCSD has been providing ECMO for decades. However, in 2018, we had a substantial restructuring of our ECMO program when we went to a nurse-run ECMO program. And so, you know, one of the big hints I kind of want to talk about, it, placing them on ECMO is the easy part. It's the care afterwards that's the challenging part. So um, the first thing I want to talk to, about, talk to you guys about was who gets ECMO. As we all know, ECMO is a scarce and resource intensive therapy. It's also very expensive. So uh, Perketa et al. from Minnesota basically discussed that we need to ensure that ECMO care is equitable across regions. And there needs to be disaster planning, similar where we have triaging of mechanical ventilators, we also need uh, triaging of ECMO resources. And that requires um, uh, cooperation between ECMO centers. And they also discussed that ECMO indications should be um, made based off the chances of the patient surviving to hospital discharge and the duration of ECMO support. So here in San Diego, we actually followed this and we actually um, created the San Diego County ECMO Consortium between four ECMO centers, um, UCSD, two other adult centers and one pediatric center. And what we did was we um, distributed our patients, shared equipment and expertise to provide um, care to not only San Diego County, which you can see here, but also Imperial County, Riverside County and some parts of um, Los Angeles County. Um, Imperial County actually had a large COVID-19 outbreak because there was a large uh, incidence rate in uh, Mexico, in Baja, Mexico, where the infection basically kind of spilled across the border. So um, in the last, since March to now, we've actually evaluated, our uh, ECMO consortium has, has evaluated about 300 patients and about 95 patients have been placed on ECMO between our three adult centers. Um, but what if you're too sick to get to an ECMO center, which you can see our three ECMO centers are all centered right here in San Diego. Well, that's where mobile ECMO kind of comes in. And so this is a study that actually came out of Columbia. Dr. Brody is actually on it, which discusses um, 100 ECMO cannulations that were done between 2008 and 2014, up to 7,000 miles away from the ECMO center in New York City that found only two complications. And like all um, publications on mobile ECMO, this, um, they always highlight the need of training between the transport teams and the cannulation teams. So at UCSD in the um, last six months, uh, we've um, deployed our ec mobile ECMO team uh, 19 times uh, for COVID-19 patients specifically across four uh, Southern California counties and 12 hospitals. The challenges are, this is, um, challenges are that one of them is just simply the eyeball test we don't really know what we're gonna get until we get there, no matter how thorough of an evaluation we do sometimes beforehand. Um, and one of the other things is unknown neurological status. Because these patients have severe ARDS, they're prone and sedated, paralyzed. Sometimes they're, sometimes they're too sick to even get to a CT head at the outside hospital. And this is why we had Dr. Sullivan actually present the second case to highlight the challenges with that. Um, so next thing I kind of want to talk about was who provides bedside ECMO care at ECMO centers. Uh, 
So this is a um, slide, this is a uh, graph that I actually created using data from the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion and ELZO. Um, on the x-axis is years. On the left y-axis is the number of perfusionists in the US and the uh, amount of ECMO cases. Uh, on the right axis is the amount of ECMO centers. So the gray line you can see um, over the last 20 years, we've increased our ECMO centers and we have about 250 in the US. Um, for the ECMO cases have significantly increased, especially after 2009, after the H1N1 outbreak. And they're um, probably around 10,000 now. This 2019 right now is underreported since that's when I pulled it. When I pulled the data, it was um, we're still waiting other centers to report their numbers. But I, what I really want you guys to see is the red line. The red line is the perfusionists in our country over the last 20 years, and it's been um, basically stable. Um, so who's going to provide care for all these extra ECMO patients? And so many um, ECMO centers have moved on to um, utilizing um, RNs as the bedside ECMO specialist. Um, and this allows for expanded capacity. And what we actually found was there's actually non-inferior outcomes, which you can see here um, with our perfusionist run versus our nurse run ECMO program, there was non-inferior um, survival and there was non-inferior complications per ECMO day. Um, we also found that there's probably, there was a 45% decrease in costs by utilizing a nurse run ECMO program. And this was also seen in, this was also published in 2015 by um, Cavarocci et al, um, uh, where they found an actual 61% decrease, uh, decrease in costs of ECMO by transitioning to a nurse run ECMO program. So um, the next question is how to set the, set the ventilator on ECMO. And this is actually why I invited Dr. Brody and Dr. Fan to join us today is because they are some of the world's experts on ventilator management of ARDS while you are on ECMO. But what we do at our center is we follow the ELZO guidelines, utilizing low respiratory rates, utilizing driving pressures less than 15, usually around 10, um, ensuring plateau pressures are less than 25, and the PEEP is anywhere between 10 and 15. We do utilize esophageal manometry to ensure that the end expiratory transpulmonary pressure is positive to prevent atelectasis at end expiration. Um, we always uh, basically rest the lungs when we put them on ECMO initially. And the other thing we also do is prone them on ECMO. Um, it's been shown in multiple case series um, that proning on ECMO is safe and feasible. And we do this during the lung rest phase, um, especially early in their ECMO course. Um, we don't, we try to take them off neuromuscular blockade during this time. Um, the other big question is how far should we rest the lung? And this is really unclear. Like how low should we set the ventilator pressures? There is some biomarker evidence, such as Dr. Fan uh, published uh, early, uh, a few, just a few months ago, um, that in 10 patients uh, during CPAP um, on ECMO had an improvement in a biomarker profile. But there's no large studies, and there's a lot of, and there's active research in this. And this is actually what my research interests are in. At UCSD, we have uh, turned down the driving pressures in 20 patients and checked biomarkers afterwards. But this is still an area of active research and not ready for mainstream yet. Um, the next thing we do at UCSD and other centers is mobilizing patients on ECMO. And this has been done actually for decades in pediatric centers and um, adult centers. And this is a study that came out of Maryland where out of 256, uh, 254 ECMO patients, about 66% of them, 170 or so, were able to undergo PT. And this is safe with femoral cannulation, with bifemoral cannulation, and with minimal complications. Um, in this study, they actually had only three minor complications out of the over uh, four or 500 uh, physical therapy sessions they had. However, currently there's lacking data on mortality or length of stay benefit with mobilization of it on ECMO. But this is also important when we try to bridge patients to transplant. So at UCSD, we have uh, utilized mobile, uh, utilized um, physical therapy to mobilize our patients um, uh, mobilize our patients that are on ECMO. Um, we limit it for our COVID-19 patients that's been limited in the room due to precautions. And you know, to mobilize these patients, we obviously have to minimize sedation. And so this is usually after our lung rest phase that we initially uh, do on these COVID-19 patients. Um, of our 35 patients that we've put on ECMO for COVID-19, we've been able to mobilize about 62% uh, on 22. We recognize though, this is not gonna be possible at every center because it's limited by PPE um, use. Uh, 
Um, this is one of our patients basically zooming in with their family here since the family can't visit with precautions. So we have them zoom in with their family while we do physical therapy. This is another patient just standing at bedside. So like all comprehensive centers, uh, we have um, we are continually trying to improve our program and educate our faculty, our providers, our nurses, everyone. And so this is just a picture here on the right side of a, a um, multidisciplinary bi-monthly meeting we have where we discuss our current cases, um, um, uh, educate everyone that's um, do a little education there and also do a literature review at the same time. And this um, basically requires a large group of dedicated professionals to run our uh, whole ECMO program from the ECMO director, coordinator, and um, uh, people who are the champions in the critical care teams, the transplant teams, and the cardiology teams. So kind of to recap the elements of a comprehensive ECMO center, we wanna ensure that we have equitable care in our county and that requires co cooperation between ECMO centers in your region. Mobile ECMO to transport patients that are too sick to get to an ECMO center. Um, uh, utilizing a nurse-run ECMO program to save costs and hopefully increase capacity. Um, we rest the lungs while we're on ECMO. Um, since ECMO doesn't really save anyone's life, it's really the, it supports people while we allow the, um, while we allow the lungs to heal. Um, we minimize sedation and maximize mobility on ECMO once we're past the lung um, rest, the lung rest phase. And then um, we're always trying to improve our program. This picture right here is of a pediatrician um, that was on ECMO for 52 days at our institute um, for COVID-19, who uh, then went to physical rehab, and then we followed him up finally in our uh, ICU recovery clinic. So if you have any questions, please um, feel free to email me or our ECMO coordinator or director of ECMO, and we'd be glad to answer any of them or any questions. So um, the next part of our talk, I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Fan. Um, and Dr. Fan is, um, as I already kind of said, one of the world's experts on ARDS and ECMO. He is one of the intensivists at the University of Toronto, um, where he also received his undergraduate degree from the University of Toronto, his medical degree from the University of Western um, Ontario, and PhD from John Hopkins. He's currently the medical director of the, Elzo Prono, El, uh, the ECMO program at Toronto General, and his research is in ARDS and uh, patients' outcomes in critical illness. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Fan. Dr. Fan, I think you just need to unmute. Okay, sorry, it was uh, not letting participants unmute, which is maybe not a <laughs> not a bad thing, but uh, can you hear me now? Yes. That's perfect. Great, so thanks very much to all the organizers uh, for the invitation to speak. Uh, my job here is to set things up for my uh, colleague and friend, Dan Brody. Uh, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna speak briefly about ECMO for COVID ARDS, both the early experience and uh, maybe some uh, facts about our experience in uh, Toronto. Uh, here are my disclosures. I'm not going to speak about any specific uh, products in my talk. Okay, so I think the key overarching idea that I want to present to the group here in considering ECMO for COVID-related ARDS is the fact that, and you've probably heard this um, many times already, that ARDS is a syndrome. And part and parcel of that is the fact that as a syndrome, this is a man-made sort of definition, much like sepsis. Um, and it involves heterogeneity. And heterogeneity has been inherent in the definition or criteria for ARDS since its inception in 1967 in the paper by Ashbon Petty. And of course, it continues to this day. And during the un, un, uh, evolution of this pandemic, we've seen, I would say, not a small amount of controversy about whether COVID, ARDS, COVID pneumonia leads to ARDS or typical ARDS or not. And some proponents of that have been um, uh, various uh, um, uh, scientists and ARDS researchers uh, from around the world um, versus others as uh, the pandemic has evolved, uh, producing data showing that, that us perhaps that in on the whole, uh, patients who have COVID-19 pneumonia really and develop severe hypoxemic respiratory failure really have what looks like pretty typical ARDS. So we tried to summarize some of the controversy here. And this is an article I had the pleasure of writing with Dan, 
and some of our other colleagues uh, from um, around the world, highlighting the fact that at least um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was very difficult. COVID was a new um, infection. It was leading to a constellation of symptoms and findings that were perhaps not traditionally seen in patients with severe um, ARDS. But as data began to uh, be produced from the pandemic, some of our hypotheses and conjectures about what COVID-19 associated respiratory failure looked like started to coalesce, I would, I would uh, say, around the idea that more often than not, these patients did have what we would consider typical ARDS. So at the time that we published this commentary, here were a number of published cohorts from around the world, um, including one from, uh, from Columbia and New York, um, and showing the distribution, if you will, of these cohorts, like their average values for things like PF ratio, most importantly, compliance, um, some of their ventilatory parameters, how much prone positioning was used, and how much ECMO. And I think the key thing to focus on here is, is that, again, as, as the cohorts uh, published more and more data, and some of these quite large um, for the purposes of the cohort, especially those from New York in terms of detailed data, um, as well as a, a cohort from Italy of over 1,300 patients. What you can see is the PF ratio on the whole, again, is relatively similar to those that we would see with moderate or severe ARDS by the Berlin definition. And the compliance also in the range um, um, depressed as those would be in similar cohorts of patients uh, who don't have COVID associated ARDS. And this is perhaps nicely summarized visually in this commentary published by my colleague, Ewan Golliger, uh, just a few weeks ago, showing that again, when you look at the respiratory system compliance, which has been something that's been harped on by many people uh, from around the world looking at ARDS, that they fall typically very close to those from the LungSafe study, which is here on the right. This is a sub subsequent analysis of the LungSafe data looking at respiratory system compliance. And you could see that again, on the whole, much of the COVID-19 ARDS cohorts have compliance that's very close to that in LungSafe, which was again, a very large global study of ARDS patients without COVID-19. But again, there's heterogeneity, which is again, in, uh, inherent in the definition of ARDS with some co cohorts who had relatively preserved compliance that have been published in the literature. I think we've seen a lot of, again, data as the ultimate sort of uh, equalizer here. And it's uh, debunked a lot of other sort of hypotheses that we had early in the pandemic. So there's cytokine storm. This is the rationale for using immunomodulatory therapy, uh, high dose steroids, uh, many other therapies that were initially uh, trialed in COVID. But again, this very nice systematic review and meta-analysis shows that in fact, not only does severe COVID-19 ARDS not lead to very high levels of IL-6, just as an example, but there are many other sort of critical care presentations or syndromes, even some of those hyperinflammatory ARDS that seem to lead to much higher levels of IL-6. So this idea that COVID-19 ARDS is a cytokine storm problem was somewhat um, debunked by the data. And again, even in the autopsy series as they began to come out was that, oh, this is a very um, thrombogenic or vasocentric uh, kind of problem. Autopsies would show that the ARDS from COVID-19 was very different. But indeed, as more and more postmortem studies were published, again, we see that the histopathological findings are very similar to those of ARDS with diffuse alveolar damage. And recall that in the diffuse alveolar damage, you also see microthrombi, bleeding, hemorrhage, these sorts of things. So relatively typical for patients with ARDS. Although there were, of course, this growing body of literature around the problems related to some kind of uh, problem with uh, the coagulation cascade in these patients presenting with more thromboembolic uh, problems, coagulopathy and thrombotic manifestations, so leading to more uh, venous thromboses, PEs, stroke, and these sorts of things that we saw nicely presented in, in uh, perhaps some of the cases um, by Dr. Sullivan. But again, just to one of the questions that was raised is what is the role of therapeutic anticoagulation in these patients at the moment, ECMO or not? I would say there's equipoise and it's unclear. And in fact, it's of course the subject of a very large global randomized control trial at the moment called the ATT&CK trial. Uh, which has also been uh, been partnered with an NIH-led active four study as well as the uh, uh, anticoagulation domain and remap cap. So hopefully again, data will win here and we'll have high quality data soon around what the role of therapeutic anticoagulation might be in these patients. Um, so the whole idea around um, starting with this framework, if you will, was, was just to say that um, I like to keep things simple um, and uh, uh, as Leonardo da Vinci once said, simplicity is the greatest sophistication, is that 
then if COVID-19 pneumonia leads to very typical on the whole ARDS, then we should just treat these patients as we normally would treat ARDS and use the large body of evidence that we have already in the last 40, 50 years looking at ARDS to manage these patients, some of which we codified in these guidelines uh, a few years ago. And again, these guidelines were rolled in uh, mostly to the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines, as well as some other uh, guidelines from NIH and other uh, and WHO around the ventilatory management of these patients. And what you can see here is to consider most of the things that we've talked about in the case uh, studies uh, uh, leading up to uh, my talk today. So considering things like um, lung protective ventilation with low tidal volume ventilation, perhaps higher PEEP, particularly in those who have evidence of recruitability, um, Consider, again, um, neuromuscular blockade, prone positioning in those with moderate to severe ARDS. And of course, again, the idea that you could consider VV ECMO, which is the focus of today's talk, or referral to an ECMO center using the local criteria for ECMO. And I think that's, again, sort of these guidelines from the Surviving Sepsis Campaign guidelines sort of suggest using what we know from ARDS um, in these patients with COVID-19-related uh, ARDS. So for ECMO, I guess the challenge was is that at the beginning of the pandemic, again, when there was a lot uh, less that was known of this new entity, this new infection, and it's uh, the syndrome that followed it, um, ECMO led to very dismal results. So this is a very crude um, pooled analysis of early reports here, um, most of them from China where the pandemic uh, began. And again, without much in the way of uh, uh, data or uh, 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 known facts, uh, they likely deployed ECMO uh, later in the course in sicker patients who had failed a number of conventional therapies, uh, perhaps not how we would consider using ECMO uh, today in ARDS patients who don't have uh, COVID-19. Perhaps we'd use them earlier within the seven to 10 day timeframe, uh, like the inclusion criteria from the CSER or EOLIA trials, um, and perhaps not in patients where uh, unfortunately they failed everything and they really are beyond the point of no return and even ECMO uh, may not salvage that situation. And what you could see here on the far right, again, is, is that the survival in these uh, sorts of small case series was extremely poor with 0% uh, in some of these uh, uh, situations. And again, so this led to early calls for the fact that, again, in this new disease and the new manifestation of severe hypoxemic respiratory failure associated with COVID-19 infection, uh, perhaps uh, we should not be utilizing ECMO because of these dismal results. And again, because of these unknown factors, which might have contributed to these poor results. But again, I, I would say, and Dan will present even more recent data, is, is that I think uh, careful um, utilization of ECMO, and again, as the guidelines would have suggested, in the usual fashion that we would consider severe ARDS patients for, um, might lead to better results. And again, this is maybe perhaps one of the better examples uh, more recently from Mathieu Schmidt and Alain Combe um, at La Pitié Hospital in Paris, publishing their experience of 83 patients that were supported with ECMO who had severe COVID-19 um, related ARDS. And again, the key message here is, is that they utilized, again, as uh, Alain being the PI of the EOLIA trial, they utilized their standard criteria for um, putting patients with ARDS onto ECMO, which pretty much are the inclusion criteria for EOLIA. And when they utilize those criteria to select patients and manage them on ECMO, what you could see here is a very complex plot on the left. But on the right is, is that um, mortality was actually um, relatively low. So at 90 days, mortality in this group was 36%. So not the nearly 100%. Um, that you, that you had seen uh, previously, uh, but um, uh, a much better survival uh, in, this, in this situation. So just to quickly maybe describe some of our experience, and this uh, works nicely with the cases presented by Dr. Sullivan without any coordination. So in the first wave in the spring, we put 36 patients uh, with COVID, severe COVID uh, pneumonia on uh, ECMO. We had actually, in preparation uh, for this uh, wave, uh, reduced um, elective cases and operations. So we actually decided not to retrieve patients as much as we normally would, which is usually about a third of patients that are referred to our center for ECMO. And we try to transfer them in early to be considered for ECMO at our center. Our patients were on average 51 years old, most of them male. All of them were supported with VV ECMO, the vast majority in, the, uh, in a dual cannula setup with an IJ femoral configuration. Uh, again, uh, ECMO runtimes were quite long, 
uh, in these patients. And um, we were quite busy uh, at the height of the first wave with uh, at 1.14 patients on ECMO simultaneously. We've subsequently become busy again in wave two. We're up to now about 10 uh, COVID patients on ECMO currently, and many of them with very long duration runs as uh, Dr. Sullivan presented in one of her cases. We currently have five of those COVID patients that have been on ECMO for more than 30 days. Um, again, much like the Paris experience, we had better survival than earlier described in the pandemic with nearly two thirds of patients surviving to decannulation. Um, median duration of, survivor, uh, of ECMO in survivors was about two weeks, uh, slightly longer in non-survivors and uh, slightly less uh, survival eventually to hospital discharge due to ongoing complications in some patients who were eventually decannulated uh, from ECMO. I think the key things I want to highlight were we didn't see as many circuit thromboses as described by other centers, we changed only nine circuits in these just over 30 patients, but we had nearly five times the amount of intracranial hemorrhage that we normally see on ECMO patients, um, which was quite concerning to us. Um, so you know, more than half of our deaths were due to intracranial hemorrhage. And this is despite us using our normal low dose heparin nomogram, the same one that we used before COVID-19. We used a very low PTT target of 45 to 60 seconds with heparin and again, as uh, Dr. Odish and Dr. Um, uh, Sullivan mentioned, like even in these patients, if they have bleeding diathesis or bleeding complications, we actually run these circuits without heparin sometimes for days, uh, which is uh, again, part of our usual practice. And again, we we're still wondering why we saw so many hemorrhages. We wonder if it's an exacerbation of COVID associated coagulopathy as well as an underlying critical illness associated microbleeds. These have been well described in the literature, including in ARDS patients seem to come perhaps with pre-existing microhemorrhages in their brain. And again, because of the interaction with COVID and perhaps the need for any coagulation, as well as um, other coagulopathy that might be acquired during ECMO, this might exacerbate the situation, although our findings are a bit unusual compared to those uh, that have been published in the literature. Second is this idea of the whole hypercoagulability, hyper excuse me, and coagulopathy seen in these patients. And again, in the more severe patients, we might expect that they might have more severe hypercoagulability. So we're actually doing a study being led by one of my fellows, Damien Rattano, looking at the use of physical elastic testing to guide um, anticoagulation in patients on ECMO. And it's just interesting, just to give you a quick example, we now have 20 patients that have uh, uh, been enrolled in the study. And we can see here is that two patients that have, they're both hypercoagulable, the top one being much more hypercoagulable uh, than the bottom, both by the TAG and uh, also in their sort of traditional uh, factors that you can see here, looking at D-dimers and fibrinogen levels. But interestingly, both these patients actually did well. They were actually both decannulated relatively uh, early in the, uh, from ECMO without any complications. They never had any circuit thrombosis and no uh, DVT both during their run and for, with screening ultrasound afterwards. So again, a lot of heterogeneity in this population, even for the hypercoagulability that we're sort of learning more about as we go on. And then finally, um, the other interesting thing is, is as highlighted by um, Dr. Sullivan's first case that we're seeing, also the same kind of concerns early in the H1N1 pandemic uh, years ago, is, is that some of these patients, especially young patients, seem to have extremely high inspiratory efforts. We monitor all these patients routinely um, for their inspiratory dry, uh, respiratory drive and inspiratory efforts using occlusion pressure and P.01 on the ventilator and those who have esophageal manometry in place, we monitor with that. Um, and we find that in many of these patients, especially early on, they have high needs for sedation and also for prolonged paralysis to, to mitigate this high respiratory drive. We sometimes increase sweep gas flow rates to try to uh, modulate respiratory drive in those that respond. Um, and again, it's maybe part of this um, presentation that we see that, uh, again, this hypothesis that perhaps p -Silly, uh, is contributing to this failure, leading them to their worsening and being on ECMO. Uh, this is something that we're trying to investigate more systematically. And then finally, the idea that I also saw that um, in the first case that Dr. Sullivan presented that soon after decannulation, the patient was able to tolerate trach collar. We also find that in many of our patients that we liberate, we wait so long that once they get decannulated from ECMO, either extubation or uh, trach collar weaning happens very quickly after that, suggesting that perhaps we could liberate them from ECMO sooner. And given our high intracranial hemorrhage rates, we're trying to do that with uh, all haste. Uh, so we actually have this quality improvement program where we're trying to do daily assessments for sweep off, almost like an SBT for ECMO. And what you could see here is just to summarize that even from four liter sweep gas, we found quite a few patients that could tolerate sweep off from four liters once they meet some screening criteria and we can get those patients decannulated 
faster. So that's something that we're also trying to do quickly. So just to conclude, um, so critically ill patients, in my view, develop uh, typical ARDS. It's heterogeneous, we know that, and more and more evidence seems to tell us that it resembles typical ARDS. So we should provide regular evidence-based management for ARDS in these patients. We should consider VD ECMO in these patients who have refractory gas exchange or who are having injurious levels of mechanical ventilation. But again, that we should be humble. At the beginning of the pandemic, there wasn't much data. We didn't know much about this new uh, disease and the idea that when the facts change, I can change my mind. So as more and more data accumulates, uh, certainly uh, we can change our thinking about how best to manage these patients. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fan. Um, one question that someone asked was during your um, looking at the anticoagulation, I think with the TEGS, were the anti TNA levels cross reference with the PTT levels in your patients? Yeah, so we're as a part of this study monitoring all the so anti TNA levels, PTT, and our viscoelastic testing. So um, interestingly, there seems to be, you know, even in the regular ECMO literature, there seems to be a dissociation. Uh, the more of these that you measure, the more confusing it is because they sometimes all diverge in different ways. But certainly in the ECMO patients, it seems that there is um, the PTT and the factor, depending on the factor eight levels, they seem to uh, maybe predict those patients who will have um, uh, very high PTTs uh, sorry, very high anti 10 a levels when the PTT is still relatively low. So this is something that we're trying to find and get some more systematic data on. So kind of leads to a situation where you might, at least for us, because we're targeting PTT over anticoagulate these patients because the anti 10 a levels become sky high. So what I would say in general, what we're finding in our COVID patients is that when the PTT level is therapeutic, according to our target, the anti 10 a levels seem to be very high. And we're sort of, we're trying to work out why that might be. And that might, again, explain some of the bleeding episodes that we're seeing uh, at higher rates in, in our patients. Yeah, similarly at UCSD, our anti 10 goals are actually uh, lower in our ECMO patients, and that's actually a 0 0.1 to 0 0.3, uh, actually. So we are 0.11 to 0.3, we've been using them because we've noticed the same correlation with the PTTs. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to now introduce Dr. F uh, Dr. Brody, um, our last presenter. Um, Dr. Brody is one of the professors of medicine at Columbia University um, in New York City. He's the chair of the executive committee of the International e ECMO uh, Network, also known as ECMO-NET, which is a research collaborative, and a member of the board of directors and the president-elect of the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization. And that organization is the one that sets most of the, that's the organization that has the ECMO registry and um, creates most of the ECMO guidelines in the world. So thank you, Dr. Brody, for being here. Okay. Uh, Madison, thanks very much uh, for the introduction and for, uh, for inviting me. This is really a to a terrific uh, forum to be able to talk about this. And it is always good to follow uh, Eddie Fan because uh, you've already learned everything you need to know. And so I will just try to maybe close this out with a, a few extra things. And, and really what I was asked to speak about is uh, the, uh, the subsequent literature that Eddie was referring to for ECMO during COVID, uh, which is the uh, study through ELSO um, that I will uh, mostly focus on uh, during just these next few minutes. Uh, these are my disclosures. The only thing that I'll talk about today is, is the ELSO study. So that, uh, as Mazza mentioned, uh, I uh, am part of the uh, ELSO organization. Um, and this is really now uh, what Eddie showed you was 83 patients from Paris from uh, Mathieu Schmidt's study. And this is really now the international experience. Uh, it's the largest experience that we have. Um, I want to uh, take special note of my colleagues, Ryan Barbro and Graham McLaren, who uh, led the effort, uh, Phil Boonstra, who's our uh, statistician, who was absolutely terrific. And of course, Eddie uh, was uh, a big part of the study as well. And so uh, this was published uh, in The Lancet uh, just a couple of months ago. And essentially we, what we did is we took the extracorporeal sport, uh, life support organization registry uh, data, and we have an addendum that we built in for COVID-19. And ultimately we had 1,035 COVID-19 ECMO patients from 213 centers across 36 countries. Um, so how did we get there? There were 1,093 ECMO patients uh, who were at least 16 years of age. So that's what we defined as an adult. Uh, 
Um, this was January 16th through uh, May 1st, although the, uh, the addendum was created in March, but we went back and captured the cases from earlier. Uh, other cases were prospectively entered into the registry. Uh, 57 of the cases uh, didn't have an addendum, so we excluded them. One of them had, uh, was on a second run. The first one was prior to COVID, so it was also excluded. And that's how we got to the 1,035. All of them were uh, lab-confirmed SARS-CoV-2. Uh, just a little bit about the ELSO registry, because uh, it's actually changed quite a bit in the last few years. Uh, this is, we're, we're above 130,000 uh, ECMO cases at this point, so it's very rich with data that can be uh, mined mostly for hypothesis uh, generation. Um, there are now strict database uh, definitions, uh, which is uh, a really important advance for the, uh, for the registry. Uh, there are detailed instructions for ELSO site managers so that uh, everything is done in a, in a coordinated fashion. The site managers have to complete a data entry exam. There's point of entry uh, data assessment with error and validity checks, and then full record validation is triggered on submission. So uh, the quality of the data, particularly in the last few years, has uh, increased uh, significantly, and the quality of the data for the uh, COVID uh, addendum is all uh, recent data. So what we were hoping to do uh, with this data is look at epidemiology, hospital course, and outcomes uh, using a multivariable COX model um, for uh, patient and hospital factors associated with in-hospital mortality. And we have 90 days of follow-up from ECMO initiation, but we only know what happens to them uh, while they're in the hospital or, or where they're transferred to. That's just the data that we have uh, in the uh, registry. So there's no post-discharge follow-up, unfortunately. Uh, the primary outcome uh, was in-hospital death assessed 90 days after ECMO initiation. And we did, very importantly, a time to event analysis. And just to think about this, um, and obviously, the, when we lock the database, not every patient uh, would have a final disposition. They, they might still be in the hospital. They might even still uh, be on ECMO. And so if you um, uh, calculate that in-hospital mortality without accounting for this differential follow-up, the, where they are in their, uh, in their, um, uh, in their course, then you end up with length time bias. So the time to event analysis uh, attempts to get around that. Uh, there are several ways that we could be uh, recognizing the patients uh, within the, de uh, the database. One is discharged alive to home or to acute rehab, and we consider that a good outcome. Uh, others were discharged to another location, which was typically an LTAC, but might've been unknown. That's uh, not as good an outcome and discharged to another hospital. And all these were uh, treated as distinct competing events for the primary outcome of in-hospital mortality. Um, if the records uh, um, at the last update, because they were updated uh, often prospectively throughout the course of the patient uh, for the pandemic, um, if the patient hadn't died, been discharged, or completed 90 days of follow-up, they were censored uh, at the time of the last update. Secondary outcomes that we looked at included uh, disposition at uh, time of analysis, uh, ECMO duration, hospital length of stay, uh, tracheostomy use, complications of all sorts, as I'll show you, uh, acute kidney injury, and then separately renal replacement therapy, because you know, as many of you know, we often use uh, renal replacement therapy for uh, ultrafiltration to remove fluid in these patients, even if they don't have uh, considerable uh, AKI. Uh, so looking uh, at some of the data, this is uh, the um, median age is around 50. Uh, the BMI uh, uh, in the obese range around 31 or 32. Uh, the, about three quarters of the patients uh, were men. And you can see this is, uh, again, 36 countries, so uh, multiple populations are represented. 14% uh, of the patients were black, 33% white, non Hispanic, 15% Asian, and 21% Hispanic. Um, of the comorbidities, 30% of the patients had no comorbidity, but uh, the most common was obesity, uh, which was almost half of the patients, and about a quarter of the patients had uh, diabetes. Um, and now here, I just want to draw your attention. So these are the, the overlapping categories that uh, the patients could be in. Uh, you can see 79% of, uh, of the patients were uh, listed as having ARDS, 5% acute heart failure, 2% myocarditis, so predominantly respiratory failure. 29% uh, had acute kidney injury and 5% had pre-ECMO cardiac arrest. Um, when you look at this, we actually uh, uh, split it off into the full cohort and then just those uh, who are the, uh, uh, labeled as ARDS, so obviously that's 100% on this side, 79% of the total cohort. But if this is our cardiac population, then you have to assume that most of these, um, uh, the rest of the patients simply weren't identified as having ARDS by the site uh, data managers. And so uh, the numbers are, are relatively similar, but we broke it up just so people could see the ARDS data. Um, similar to the Paris data, uh, Eddie didn't show it, but the, it was four days um, uh, from intubation, uh, endotracheal intubation until uh, the start of ECMO. Um, that's the same uh, as in that study. 
Uh, the uh, median peak was 14. Uh, we have peak inspiratory pressure just because that's what we collect. We can't uh, e as easily collect plateau pressure. So the peak was 33 as a, as a stand-in. Uh, the PDEF ratio uh, on average was uh, 72 and, uh, or excuse me, the median, and the PCO2 uh, was uh, relatively high at 60. 60% uh, of, of the patients received prone positioning prior to receiving ECMO support. And that's kind of amazing. If you think about, uh, you know, from the lung safe study, 16% of patients with severe ARDS uh, were put in the prone position. Uh, and I think we're seeing that now more and more across the world that uh, COVID is uh, maybe the silver lining of COVID for ARDS is that uh, prone positioning has become much more common. Nearly three quarters of the patients were on neuromuscular blockade, 60% of them were on uh, vasoactive support. Uh, this is both, uh, this is primarily actually before the recovery trial, but 41% uh, received glucocorticoids. Um, and you see again here, respiratory support, meaning VV ECMO was 96% of the patients. So again, most of these patients uh, almost certainly had uh, ARDS. Uh, what were the outcomes? Well, the punchline is an in-hospital uh, death of uh, 37%. And this is, it's called a stack bar plot. And it uh, basically shows you the different dispositions uh, and uh, their relative probability. So uh, here is death. Obviously, when you start, everybody's hospitalized. Some of them will die and that accumulates over time, uh, ended up around 37.4%. Uh, the hospitalized patients by the end were very few. These are the patients who were uh, censored because we didn't know their status, uh, discharged, uh, discharged to LTAC or unspecified, and, and here are the patients who went home uh, or to rehab. Uh, again, this is just the cumulative incidence of mortality uh, uh, from the time of uh, ECMO initiation. And uh, that estimated cumulative incidence uh, at day 90 was 37.4%. If you only look at those with final disposition of death or hospital discharge, and this sort of tripped up the group uh, a little bit, at least from a publicity standpoint, uh, from the North Shore data, uh, where they, uh, the, the discrepancy in mortality was much greater uh, uh, when uh, looking at it this way, you can see that actually uh, looking at it that way as well, the mortality is quite similar at 39%. Uh, these patients overall were similar to Eolio patients in many ways. Um, so they uh, likely people are, are using very similar, if not uh, Eolio criteria itself. Uh, pre ECMO prone, as I showed you, was 60%. In Eolia, prior to randomization, it was 59%. Uh, just keep in mind that 90% of the control patients in Eolio did receive prone positioning. Uh, median P to F ratio was 72. The mean P to F in Eolia was 73, so not the same, uh, but just showing that they're uh, similar patients. Uh, no patients were discharged to hospice. The uh, Kaplan-Meier median duration of hospitalization was 27 days, and it was about twice as long, 31 days, as it was for survivors as for uh, non-survivors. Uh, what about complications? This is really important as we talk about this. We, tracheostomies included. I don't actually consider that a complication, but uh, about half of patients were traked. Um, uh, looking here, uh, you can see uh, rates of uh, seizure, uh, infarct, uh, CNS hemorrhage, 6%, it was 5% in the Paris study. Um, hemolysis, uh, membrane lung failure, pump failure, and circuit change. I just wanna actually look at it uh, here. This is from the supplement. And um, what we did is we compared it with 2019 uh, rates in, uh, of complications in adults uh, receiving ECMO. And so that it's the 2020 COVID population against pre-COVID. Um, and what we see is that uh, you uh, see more CNS infarct, uh, half the rate of, uh, uh, or excuse me, more, uh, less CNS infarct in the COVID population, twice the rate of hemorrhage. Um, and then in terms of what would represent clotting, because this is one of our big questions, are they clotting, are they bleeding both? I think it is both. Um, here you see more membrane lung failure, almost you know, two and a half times as much, uh, more circuit change. Uh, again, that's, it's a slippery definition since there's not a standard for when you change out a circuit uh, and uh, almost twice as many circuit clots. Um, but we know that their runs are longer than typical ARDS patients uh, you know, that are non-COVID. And so we normalized it for the number of hours on ECMO. And once you do that, you see that essentially all of these differences uh, disappear. So the accumulation of complications, at least in uh, an observational fashion, goes away when you normalize for the amount of time on ECMO. But of course, uh, we don't know that uh, being that this is observational, that these centers aren't, for instance, uh, anticoagulating at higher levels than they normally would. So the comparison is not necessarily an apples to oranges comparison, but we weren't able to detect a true difference uh, in complication rates. Um, factors associated with in-hospital mortality, this is the, um, uh, one of the major uh, points of the study. Um, you can see that age is very closely associated with it, not surprising uh, given what we know about COVID, but for each uh, decade of life, there's increasing uh, mortality. Uh, increased, uh, or excuse me, immunocompromised patients uh, associated with uh, increased uh, in-hospital mortality, pre-ECMO cardiac arrest, and the initial mode being either veno-arterial or veno-venous arterial as opposed to uh, veno-venous ECMO, 
associated with higher mortality. Uh, summarizing, this is uh, the ELSA registry data from January to May uh, for lab confirmed SARS CoV 2 as patients age 16 and above, 1,035 in total, 213 hospitals from 36 countries with a 37.4% uh, 90 day mortality after ECMO, which is similar to prior studies, uh, including EOLIA. Uh, higher mortality with increasing age and circulatory support are uh, major messages. Um, and then just very briefly, wanted to point out one other uh, paper that's, um, uh, that, that's out there that's been much discussed. If you haven't seen this, it's a really interesting uh, uh, research letter published in uh, JAMA Surgery by Asif Mustafa and colleagues uh, from Chicago. And uh, the, the reason it is, and I'll, I'll show you at the end, that the mortality was really low in these patients. So the question is why? And um, this is 40 uh, COVID ARDS patients at two centers in Chicago. They used EOLIA criteria uh, as their uh, uh, initiation criteria. And they used the Protect Duo cannula. And for those who aren't familiar with it, it's a dual lumen cannula that floats like a PA catheter into the pulmonary artery and it uh, uh, draws blood into the uh, ECMO circuit from the right atrium and then uh, reinfuses it directly into the pulmonary artery. So it's sometimes used as a right ventricular assist device um, in this setting. Perhaps if there is excess clot in the Paris study, there were uh, of the uh, 83 patients, uh, 19 of them had uh, PE noted on uh, or during ECMO. Uh, none were seen in Eolia, but we didn't look for it. Um, so maybe there's a propensity to clot. And you can imagine that RV failure might be more prominent and this, that there might be a, a, a reasonable biologic mechanism for why this could be um, better than two-site uh, cannulation. But they did a whole package of interventions. And I think it's really important to understand that this wasn't simply the use of a dual lumen uh, uh, RVAD, um, but that they also use direct thrombin inhibitors instead of heparin and higher than their normal dose. They use glucocorticoids from the outset prior to recovery at very high doses, higher than is used in recovery. They used inhaled nitric oxide, which if there is some uh, vascular uh, abnormality in this uh, disease might actually be playing uh, some role. Um, and they had a goal of extubating the patients and doing physical therapy, uh, which they were able to accomplish in the great majority of the patients. Um, so one would think that if they're doing all these things and they have, uh, you know, great outcomes, perhaps they're, you know, putting less sick patients uh, on ECMO, but it doesn't really seem like that from the data. Uh, if you look at the median age, it's 51, 75% uh, men, like in uh, the ELSO registry data, 40% uh, African-American, 35% Hispanic, reflecting the population that they see uh, there in Chicago. Uh, the BMI was 34, uh, with 70% of patients being obese and 58% having hypertension. Uh, the PEEP uh, on average, again, that's a, a set parameter, but it was uh, relatively high at 17 with a plateau pressure uh, of 32. They don't uh, report the compliance. Uh, the P to F uh, ratio was uh, 68.9, again, very similar. 73% of patients were placed in the prone position, which uh, in the United States of America deserves a medal. That's fantastic. 78% um, uh, were uh, neuromuscular blockers and uh, very similar, same as the ELSO uh, study, 60% received vasopressors. And the uh, mean time from ECMO initiation to endotracheal extubation uh, was 13 days. Uh, so this is uh, the, uh, the data you can see here, this is up to the 40th patient going on ECMO. Uh, here there, uh, the patient's being extubated. So most of them were decannulated, discharged from ICU and discharged from hospital. So when they locked the database, they still had 11 of the 40 patients in hospital. They had a 15% mortality. Um, those patients were subsequently discharged alive, although they uh, say that their uh, mortality is now between 17 and 20% and they're up to uh, about 90 patients. Um, so that data is, I think, hypothesis generating. I don't think we really understand what part of the secret sauce, and we've talked very extensively, Eddie and I both, with um, uh, uh, Dr. Mustafa and his colleagues. Um, and they've done a terrific job, and they've done something well. We just don't know exactly what it is. So we're looking through the data to try to isolate that and perhaps do a rapid series of uh, pilot randomized controlled trials to identify what really works um, and that we could all use. Um, just a, a, the last little bit on upcoming data. This is uh, Euro ELSO, the European uh, branch of ELSO has a survey for ECMO centers uh, in uh, Europe uh, where they are collecting data from all of these hospitals. Uh, this is actually the end of October. They already had uh, 1,754 patients enrolled from 177 centers. So we expect really good data uh, to be coming out of that at some point. Uh, this is the COVID-19 Critical Care Consortium uh, by uh, John Frazier uh, and colleagues. Uh, John is in uh, Brisbane in Australia. Um, and uh, this is uh, more than 53 countries now participating. 
uh, in this study of both ECMO and other mechanically ventilated patients in the ICU. So we'll have comparator groups and there are several uh, papers that are already uh, uh, either submitted or soon to be submitted from this effort. And we hope a lot of good data will come from it. So uh, between the ELSO website where you can now see the updates and the uh, COVID data uh, relatively live uh, with uh, updated mortality, this is uh, the older mortality um, and uh, uh, the Euro ELSO survey in COVID-19, we do hope to have more data uh, to be able to share with the community uh, in the coming months. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Brody. Um, and uh, just to be respectful of everyone's time, uh, it's through about 15 minutes over, I'm just gonna ask one of the few, uh, few questions in the chat. Um, one was, I think specifically for COVID-19 patients, do you guys plan for lung transplant in these patients if they don't recover from ARDS? Uh, well, do we, did you say we have an hour to talk about this? Um, yeah. So I, that's really one of the toughest uh, questions. Uh, we do have someone at our center who is uh, bridging to transplant, uh, who is now day 240 something uh, on ECMO. And uh, if at that point your lungs aren't recovering, I think you can feel pretty safe that, uh, that transplant is the only option. Uh, there are a lot of patients out there. We get called all the time about patients who are hundred days or more on ECMO with, uh, there, there are very few late recoveries at that stage. Um, and so the question is, when do you pull the trigger on transplant? I don't think anybody has a right answer. Uh, we definitely have seen a number of, uh, of uh, COVID patients who have recovered in the day 70 to 80 range, um, where there's a patient at a hospital in California that I'm uh, following along with, uh, where the patient is now day maybe 120 or so and starting to get better. And so uh, we really don't understand uh, when these patients could get better just with tincture of time and really good supportive care, uh, not just ECMO, but really good ICU care. Um, and so I think we, we all have to pay attention as a community to what's going on out there in terms of when we would pull the trigger. Certainly there are some patients um, who we've seen uh, now uh, uh, autopsy reports, or excuse me, uh, explant reports uh, in addition to autopsy reports where clearly the lungs looked like they did not have potential to recover. Um, but figuring out who those patients are is still a really tough challenge. Thank you. I think another question for you and Dr. Pan, one of the, I think will be the last question is, um, how do you know after you rest the lungs initially on ECMO with like the ELSO setting, ELSO guidelines, when do you start re-challenging the lung? Like unsedating the patient and uh, letting them take the larger tidal volumes, but you have to make sure you don't, you have to also prevent silly from occurring, self-induced lung injury. Eddie, do you want to start with that? Uh, yeah, so I think that's uh, a great million dollar question. <laughs> um, and it's, it's not completely clear. And I think uh, this, this is part of the, and also an active area of research. We're interested in actually doing a randomized trial of weaning ECMO first versus weaning mechanical ventilation first. And I think the key to not only your clinical question, but designing such a trial is when is the point where we should pull the trigger and say they're ready to do one or the other? Right. And I think at this point, it's really a clinical judgment. I'd be interested to hear what Dan has to say, but I mean, just like we would in non ECMO patients, like, you know, there are other clinical signs of improving the, you know, fever is abated, the white count is coming down, whatever the clinical condition that precipitated ARDS or respiratory failure is improving. There's radiologic um, improvement. Um, again, as you mentioned in your program, you ventilate these patients on pressure control as we do with lung rest settings that at a fixed driving pressure, because the compliance is improving, we see tidal volume increasing. And then I think at that point, what we do is almost like anything else. So we would switch them to ARDS ventilation, liberalize their tidal volume to maybe four to six mils per kilo, maybe starting with four mils per kilo and see what kinds of uh, consequences we have, right? So how they tolerate that from a synchrony point of view as we reduce sedation, see what their monitor their plateau pressure, uh, again, if you have esophageal manometry in place, we monitor their transpulmonary pressures. Um, and importantly, again, we're also monitoring their respiratory drive and inspiratory efforts. And if any of those things are sort of at the moment in, um, in a range that we might consider injurious, plateau pressure is about 30, tidal volume above six, driving pressure above 15, um, you know, P.1 that's extremely negative or occlusion pressure is extremely negative, suggesting high drive, then we either resedate the patient, change the ventilation, increase ECMO support, and then try again the next day. Just like you would say in your quest to liberate the patient from mechanical ventilation. 
Um, one of the um, speakers talked about, you know, RV failures seen about um, 20 to 30% in um, severe ARDS patients. And on ECMO, some centers use beta blockade to decrease the hyper um, adrenergic response when you like desedate them on ECMO to improve their oxygenation. What are your thoughts about adding beta blockers to uh, decrease that, that response? Uh, Dr. Fan, Dr. Brody, I think you guys are muted. Yeah, sorry, the host <laughs> had to come on. Um, so uh, beta blockers, be careful. So you will always, uh, virtually always, uh, improve the oxygenation. So people use beta blockers often when uh, the patient is hypoxemic despite ECMO. Uh, we know that the percentage of cardiac output going through the device is what's gonna determine your, uh, your uh, oxygen saturation. Um, and in fact, uh, Mathieu Schmidt from Paris has shown that uh, if you 60% of your cardiac output is going through the device at any given time, then you'll have a sat around 90%. And if that's your target, that's debatable. Um, if you put somebody on beta blocker, you're going to decrease uh, cardiac output. When you decrease cardiac output, the percent and you don't change the ECMO device, the proportion going through the device will be larger. And so your sat will go up. And that's just the physiology of ECMO. The problem is what we care about is not the set, but the delivery of oxygen. And oxygen delivery is a function, as we all know, of uh, saturation hemoglobin uh, dissolved oxygen. It matters a little bit when you're very anemic, um, but uh, is, is cardiac output. And so if you decrease cardiac output without measuring your oxygen delivery, um, then you don't know if you actually made them uh, better or worse uh, based on doing that. So I would encourage people not to do it necessarily unless you actually have a good measure of uh, of uh, uh, oxygen delivery, which is difficult to do. Um, that's what I would say. I don't know, Eddie, do you agree? I think we're locked yeah. up. I'm gonna say he agrees. Yeah, I, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it simple, yeah. And that's similar to us. We uh, tolerate lower saturation so long as there's no end organ damage. Exactly. Like sat cell, like 85. All yeah, right. And there's actually, uh, you know, in Karolinska Institute in uh, Sweden, where they've been doing ECMO forever and ever, they allow SATs to go 70 for prolonged periods of time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've, I've, for one, I'm not comfortable with that, uh, but it's exactly what you said. It's, you know, if you can show that end organ uh, function is reasonable, then um, you don't have to worry about the SAT. Yep. All right. Well, you know, we're 20 minutes over time. Uh, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, thank you, Dr. McGuire, Dr. Sullivan, and especially thank you, Dr. Brody and Dr. Fan, for joining us. Um, if you guys have any other questions, there, our contact information is on the ATS website. Thank you all again for joining. Have a great night. Thank you very much.